What are you looking for? These are the first words spoken by Jesus in the Gospel of John. Another way to put it would be to ask, what is the meaning and purpose of your life? This question of Jesus echoes the words of the ancient Hebrew philosopher Philo in his treatise, The Worse Attacks the Better. Philo's essay suggests that there is an authentic self in each of us which seeks meaning and may even find it in self-mastery, courage, piety, virtue, or in other forms of goodness. But to realize this truth, this self has to overcome forces of illusion, distraction, and fear. In short, we have to overcome the demands of our ego to have a meaningful life. Now this naturally leads to a related question. What holds you back from experiencing your life as a child of God? Perhaps you're just too busy. Work demands so much more from us than it did a generation ago before the beginning of cell phones. Maybe you just cannot believe in a personal God who cares about you, especially when you see the enormity of suffering and evil in the world. Perhaps you're afraid of being taken in or that because of what you did, you do not deserve to be God's child. On our Tuesday night forum, we had the guest Timber Hawkeye here. He's a um, Buddhist teacher who grew up in the high school of San Francisco. Uh, he's a lovely person. It was a delightful conversation. But he said that when he goes to churches, he likes to do this little experiment. He likes to ask everybody in the room who believes in God, and then everybody raises their hand. And then he says, um, and I want you to raise your hand if you've ever, if you worry. And then everybody raises their hand because we all worry. And then he points out the contradictions. Like, how can you worry if you believe in God? Now, in my head, was he was, as he was explaining this, I said, it's completely easy for me to do both, even at the same time. Sometimes my words and actions clearly show that I am not believing in God very much. The question of meaning lies at the heart of the 2022 film called Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. In the first scene of the film, it introduces Evelyn, a Chinese immigrant who works above her laundromat. Um, so she works above the shop of the laundromat and she's struggling with a father who's visiting her, who disapproves of her, a daughter who's a teenager and who she, she has a hard time connecting with. And to make things even much, much worse, she's also being audited by the IRS. So her husband, as she's doing all these busy tasks, so her husband's buzzing around. He's kind of a silly husband. He's trying to make her laugh and smile. And she doesn't realize it, but their relationship is about to break. Then, at the IRS offices, Evelyn discovers a connection to the multiverse. Now, in case you didn't know what a multiverse is, the idea is that every time each of us makes a decision in our life, the universe splits. So there's one um, Evelyn, which decided to, to disregard the advice of her father and marry her husband, Waymond. And that was one path. And then there's the other path, which followed her father's advice and didn't marry Waymond. So all these different branches of univer the universe means that there are billions and billions of us in parallel other universes. And so that's the situation. She learns from the, someone in the Alpha universe that there's a way to connect with your other self in all these other universes. Now, there's a lot more to explain in the film, but I, I think that might be enough. Um, there, but the point of it all is that one of her husbands from an alternative universe comes to her and says, look, Evelyn, of all the billions of Evelyns in the entire spectrum of universes, you are the one who is the greatest failure. That at every decision point along your course of your life, you made the wrong decision. Now, in the end, Evelyn realizes the power of overcoming our tendency to judge and to criticize ourselves and others 
so that we can continually repair and cultivate our relationships. And the film says this is the meaning of our life. The Gospel of John begins with a hymn about how Christ is present at the very beginning of all things and that darkness will never overcome this light. And then it describes the baptism of Jesus. And the next day, John is with his friends and he gestures to Jesus and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And the baptizer says he knows that this is the Lamb of God because he saw the Spirit of God descend and remain upon him. Now there's two different ways that people interpret this. People, some people interpret Jesus as offering a kind of sacrifice. So what Jesus suffers so that the rest of us don't have to. And I believe that that view is wrong. I believe that uh, in the in ancient Near East, they didn't sacrifice lambs. They, they sacrificed goats and rams and they sacrificed cattle, but they didn't sacrifice lambs. Instead, what John is talking about is the exodus. When the people of Israel are trying to escape out of slavery into freedom and they are protected by the blood of the lamb that's put on the lintel post so that they're protected from having their firstborn children um, to being killed. So they are saved and set free by this act of the Lamb's blood. The word sin in this text is singular. Sin, not sins. It's not about individual things that we did wrong. It's not primarily about sex or, or your private morality. When Jesus, we say Jesus takes away the sin of the world, we're referring to sin as a kind of disease. It keeps all of us, everyone, everywhere from caring for each other and ultimately from finding fulfillment. Sin is prejudice. It's fear of scarcity. It's competition for attention. It's confusing people for our enemies. It's ignoring the needs of others. It's not seeing the value in our own uniqueness. It is asserting our identity in ways that put us at odds with others. It is thinking that we are somehow separated from the well-being of other people. Social theorist Bell Hooks describes sin as the failure of love. She writes, Everywhere we learn that love is important, and yet we are bombarded by its failure. In the realm of the political, among the religious, in our families, and in our romantic lives, we see little indication that love informs our decisions, strengthens our understanding of community, or keeps us together. This bleak picture in no way alters the nature of our longing. We still hope that love will prevail. We still believe in love's promise. This is the way that God has made us with this longing. And Jesus, Jesus believes in love's promise. He invites Andrew to spend the day with him and Andrew becomes quickly convinced that Jesus is the Messiah. Andrew's brother, Simon, reaches the same conclusion because Jesus is so thoroughly understanding of him. Philip responds almost immediately to Jesus' invitation. Jesus tells Nathanael, he said, Nathanael, I saw you under the fig tree. And whatever it was that Nathanael experienced there leads him to declare that he is the Messiah. The point is, is that Jesus does not present an argument for believing. Instead, he offers a question. What are you looking for? And an invitation. Come and see. We can do the same thing. The theologian Karl Barth writes that according to St. John, the whole meaning and purpose of the mission of Jesus is to bring joy. We too can live in this joy, but it requires us to embrace a new way of life. Karl Barth also writes this, and this is the hardest sentence I'm going to preach to you for the next six months for sure. Faith is not obedience, but as obedience is not obedience without faith, Faith is not faith without obedience. 
The idea is that faith, de de it, it demands something of us. It requires something of us. And that without obedience, faith isn't full or complete. I want to close with two remarkable stories about Christians who answered the call to come and see. Before a huge gathering, Martin Luther King Jr.'s assistant told him that there were credible threats against his life. And yet he still went on and in front of the massive crowds that he faced in the speech that night, Martin Luther King talked about his own death. And he said, I don't want you to act in a revengeful way. I don't want you to be violent if something happens to me. I want you to continue the path of nonviolence. And afterwards, he was kind of shaking and his friend Ralph Abernathy came up and put an arm around him and said, Martin, are you okay? And he said that Martin Luther King said he found himself wishing that there was an honorable way out, that he didn't have to be the one to lead the people. Not long after that, on, on a night he came home late after another late night meeting and everyone in the house was sound asleep and he just slipped quietly into bed and, and the phone rang. And on the other end of the phone, there was an ugly voice and it said, I'm going to blow your head off. I'm going to blow up your whole house if you don't get out of town in three days. And then hung up. King was so upset by this, he went downstairs he brewed a cup of coffee and he started pacing back and forth and, and he thought about all the philosophy and theology that he studied and, and he seriously considered quitting. And then he sat at the kitchen table and he put his head in his hands and he prayed. And he said, Lord, I'm down here. I'm just trying to do what's right. But I'm weak. I'm afraid. And people... They're looking to me for leadership and, and I don't have anything left. And then with tears in his eyes, he felt a kind of presence stirring inside him. And there was an inner voice that seemed to speak with great assurance saying, Martin Luther, stand up for justice. Stand up for righteousness. Stand up for the truth. And lo, I will be with you even to the end of the world. And it was the voice of Jesus promising to never leave him. And his trembling stopped and he felt a kind of inner calm that he'd never known before. God stopped being a kind of metaphysical category and became a comforting presence in his life. Now at Grace Cathedral, we've been offering bystander training to equip people who are here to understand how to confront injustice and unkindness out there in the world where things are rough. And Alma Robinson strongly recommends these sessions. One day after the opera, she was near Costco on a Sunday afternoon and she could kind of see out of the corner of her eye that there was a woman kind of coming toward her and Alma immediately figured that that woman was coming to ask her for money and Alma didn't have any money. She just had credit cards and she wasn't going to give the lady her credit card. So she's kind of inching away from the woman and then she remembered something that she learned in bystander training and that was almost like a voice to her to lean into her discomfort. And so instead of turning away from this woman who was seeking her attention, she went over to her and she asked if everything was okay. Now the woman, she said, I want your cell phone. <laughs> I want to make a phone call. And Alma said, well, I'm not going to give you my cell phone, but listen, I'll dial the number for you. We'll put it on speaker and, and then you can make the call that way. And the woman dialed the number and it was the number for the woman's mother in Minnesota. And the two hadn't spoken in some time. And, and it was a, almost a kind of tearful reunion. And, and the mother in Minnesota, she said, Alma, you got to call emergency services right away. And so as soon as they got off the phone, Alma dialed the telephone number for the ambulance. And just as Alma's Uber was coming up, the ambulance was coming up too. And the next day, Alma got a phone call from Minnesota, from the woman's mother. And the woman said, 
I, don't, I can't tell you how grateful I am to you. Our daughter's been suffering with mental illness. Our daughter took her cell phone and threw it into the San Francisco Bay and we, we haven't been able to find her or reach her. We didn't know where she was. We didn't know whether, where she was sleeping. We didn't know if she was okay. And we're so grateful that you as a mother were able to help her. What are you looking for? And what stands in the way of experiencing yourself as a child of God? In this universe, we are busy, judgmental, preoccupied with failure. We sometimes feel afraid of being taken in, not always sure that we deserve good things. We believe in God and we worry at the same time. And yet Jesus promised. He promises that we can be healed of the disease that separates us from those whom we should love. That he can free us from the power of sin. Perhaps we think too much about the meaning of our own life. The meaning of Jesus' life is to bring joy everywhere, all at once. He does not give us an argument for believing, but an invitation to come and see.